Rolling. This is the Fed Sock Films Podcast. Where we continue the conversation sparked, sparked on, on film. film. Quite on set. You want to know what freedom tastes like? It tastes like this beer. Take one. This is, in fact, the classic solution in search of a problem. Action cannot help but be controversial. Cut. With expert discussion and analysis. With the greatest legal minds on the topic today. The Fed Sock Films Podcast. It's a wrap. Welcome to the Fed Sock Films Podcast. I'm Samantha Schroeder, Deputy Director of Fed Sock Films. Today's episode is inspired by our film, Image of an American, Frederick Douglass and the Right to Vote, a short documentary that explores Frederick Douglass's journey to ensure African Americans have the right to vote through the creation of the 15th Amendment. While most people have heard of Frederick Douglass, few may know that he was the most photographed man of the 19th century, and even fewer might know that Douglass, in fact, gave a lecture on photography. Here today to discuss Frederick Douglass and his lecture on pictures is Tim Sandifer, Vice President for Litigation at the Goldwater Institute and author of Frederick Douglass, Self-Made Man, published in 2018. Welcome to the show, Tim Sandifer. Thanks for having me on. I'd like to open by playing an excerpt from our film, Image of an American. Take a listen. Frederick Douglass was the most photographed American of the 19th century. Frederick Douglass used his image along with his rhetoric, his words, his speeches, to communicate an image of what it meant to be an American, what it meant to be a human being. The number one thing on his plate was to get the black man the vote. So Tim, why did you write a book about Frederick Douglass? Well, his uh, bicentennial was coming up in 2018, and uh, I thought it would be an opportunity to uh, do up a short, I wanted to see if I could do it in 100 pages, do up a short uh, study of the man's life and ideas, particularly his ideas, because I've been an admirer of Frederick Douglass since I was in high school, and I've read basically every, every new book that comes out about him over the years, and Although people are you know, aware of his fascinating personal life, that he escaped slavery and became this world-renowned figure, usually people stop there and they don't explore his work as, a, as an intellectual, as a political mm-hmm. philosopher and as an activist. And I think that's really, really amazing stuff. When you read his speeches and his articles, the, it, aside from his personal background, he was just a fascinating thinker about political and philosophical ideas. And I think it's a shame that that tends to be neglected. So your title describes Frederick Douglass as self-made. How was he self-made? Well, Douglass uh, gave a lecture called Self-Made Men. It was his most popular lecture. He gave it something like 50 times or so over his whole, over his career. And, uh, Self-made, of course, what he means by that is people who, in his phrase, uh, if they have climbed high, have built their own ladders. That is, people who came into the world without the the privilege of wealth and status and family position and so forth, but nevertheless rose to the heights of their professions or careers or whatever through their own efforts, through their own hard work. Now, obviously, every audience that he gave that lecture to knew that he himself was one of these people, is a person born Mm -hmm. in slavery, had no formal education, escaped slavery at the age of 20, taught himself more or less to read and write and also to be, be a famous public speaker and rose to the point where he was, you know, a United States ambassador for crying out loud. So he obviously mm-hmm. was a self-made man, but he, he of course, was too modest to mention in his speech that he himself was a self-made man. So I, I just thought it was a very a, an apt title for a person who is as self-made as, is it, as it is really possible to be in this world. So self-made makes me think of the word selfie, but although those really didn't exist um, in his era, <laughs> why was Douglas fo- the most uh, photographed man of his era? You know, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, you know, the selfie link actually is a pretty strong one. Douglas loved photography. He was fascinated by photography, which was a relatively new technology in his time. And it's true. He's the most photographed American of the 19th century. It seems like whenever he would give a speech, and that's, you know, how he made his living primarily was as a traveling lecturer. Whenever he would give a speech, he would go down to the local photography studio and have his picture taken. And in fact, a while back, they published a book called Picturing Frederick Douglass that contains Mm -hmm. uh, these photographs. Amusingly enough, in all of these hundreds of pictures, there is only one of him smiling. Every hmm. single one of them, he has this that famous, stern, serious look on his face. 
Uh, and I think part of it was that he wanted to project, as the audio clip that you played says, he wanted to project an, an, a serious intellectual who was also a black man, which was something that, of course, most Americans had never experienced, had never encountered in their lives at that time, and that many people denied was possible. And Douglas wanted to project this image and say, look, you know, I, it doesn't, the skin color doesn't matter. What matters is that I am a, a person like you. And in fact, a person who has really taught himself a lot and become a really serious thinker. But I think there was also a really interesting philosophical angle to Douglas's fascination with photography. Mm -hmm. Sounds like he was on a, a PR campaign for the Black American intellectual um, of his day. <laughs> yes, he was. And in fact, um, I put on the cover of my book the a picture, which is my favorite picture of Douglas, which uh, he took in Hillsdale, Michigan, uh, just down the road from my uh, alma mater. So... Why did Douglas give this lecture on pictures? Tell me about this uh, lecture that he gave. He actually gave several lectures on on photographs and um, refined them and revised them over time. Now, remember, this is the, the mid to late 19th century when there's no television, there's no radio. What you do for entertainment is you go to hear a traveling lecturer and you would mm -hmm. you know, read in your newspaper that some famous person is coming to town and is going to give a talk about whatever it might be. And you would have, you know, it might be a really famous person like Mark Twain, maybe would be reading from some of his books or you'd have a, a famous traveler who would come and tell you about you know, South America or something, or a scientist to tell you about the latest discovery in dinosaurs or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, Douglas would come to town and he would give lectures and it would be, you know, maybe it would be the self-made man lecture. Maybe it would be about slavery or something, but he also developed these lectures about photography and they're about the, the meaning of picture making. So it's not just photography. He also talks about painting and things. And, mm -hmm. and what he's interested in in these lectures is what does it say about humanity that human beings are the only creatures that make pictures? Hmm. And his answer to that is that this is a really, really revealing aspect of what it means to be human. Here's a, a passage from one of his lectures. The process by which man is able to posit his own subjective nature outside of himself, giving it form, color, space, and all the attributes of distinct personality, so that it becomes the subject of distinct observation and contemplation, is at the bottom of all effort and the germinating principles of all reform and all progress. So what he's saying is what we do is imaginatively, we reflect upon, we see nature and then imaginatively reflect upon it and create sort of an alternative nature. What we think it would, how the world would look if it were improved. And then we create a picture out of that and then aspire to do that thing. A while back, the famous uh, 20th century philosopher Iris Murdoch said, uh, man is a creature that makes a picture and then tries to be like the picture. And that's what Douglas is saying. It sounds like he's even touching on uh, a bit of a theological or spiritual realm of what it means to be human. Very much so. And he talks in these lectures about the, the religious aspect, what, what religious art does. And now... Douglas was was a, a Protestant, and he's speaking to largely Protestant audiences. So in some mm -hmm. passages, he criticizes what he sees as over-reliance on pictures by Roman Catholicism, which is, you know, it's a longstanding uh, uh, part of the debate between those two schools. But here's, here's a passage of what he says. Of all of our religious denominations, the Roman Catholic understands this picture passion of man's nature best. It addresses the religious consciousness in its own language, the child language of the soul. Pictures, images, and other symbolical representations speak the language of religion. The mighty fortress of the human heart silently withstands the rifled cannon of reason, but its walls tremble when brought under the magic power of mystery. So he's saying pictures, you know, can speak to us in ways that rational argument and philosophical debate might not. Obviously, that's an idea that we today can very much sympathize with since we live in the world of cinematography and motion pictures, which is uh, post-dated Douglas's own lifetime. It's interesting we're talking about this, given that you're a lawyer and our audience is mostly uh, lawyers and law students. And one would think that words are greater than pictures, at least in our fields. And it reminds me of a quote that I read in his lecture. 
where I think he's, he's quoting someone else, but he writes, give me the making of a nation's ballads and I care not who has the making of its laws. The picture and the ballad are alike, if not equally social forces. Why do you think you focus so much on pictures, um, you know, over words, at least in his philosophical musings? Yeah, you know, that's a that's a marvelous passage. And Douglas, you know, he for one thing, he's living during the age of high romanticism. Douglas's favorite writer was Alexandre Dumas. He loved Victor Hugo and, and Charles Dickens. And so he's he's reading these novels by the great romantic writers. And what romanticism mm. tries to do is it it, it says it says art is not about reproducing a, a faithful picture of the world. Art is instead about projecting ideals, taking ideas and putting them in the form of actions by characters in a novel or in an image, in a painting or something, projecting the world as we would like to see it or what is kind of the same thing, the world as we would like to avoid it, right? You can also have mm. horror, horrifying literature or pictures like Dostoevsky or something. But it's it's an art form that tries to imagine ideals in one sense or another. And Douglas is saying, you know, you can make all your arguments, all your legal and philosophical arguments, and that's all very important. And obviously that's what he devoted his career to, is making those kinds of arguments. But in the end, it's the artistic imagination. It's the pull of the heart that really makes the 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 real difference in the world it's making it's projecting what you want the world to be like and and pulling at our sympathies that really changes the world and i think lawyers can totally understand that lawyers you know for one thing there have been a great many famous poets who are lawyers uh mm -hmm. wallace stevens comes to mind and and poets do the same thing in uh, in a sense that lawyers do. They, pr in fact, uh, poets refer to to their poems as containing what they call argument. On, on the argument of a poem is a technical term that means what is the flow of ideas in this poem, and it's kind of similar to what what lawyers are. L lawyers are making the the premises conclusion kind of logical argument. Poets are trying to put you in the mindset and say what is it like to experience the world in some way or other. And a good lawyer knows how to blend those two things in the right degree to get the judge or the jury to not only understand the rational argument, but also to want the kind of world that the verdict incorporates. Your romanticism point is so fascinating. Um, it sounds like for Douglas, romanticism might have been a, a kind of pathway to forge a vision for the new Black American citizen and yes. how they integrate into society. Yes, that's very well put. That's exactly right. And in, in fact, it, uh, Douglas enjoyed pointing out that Dumas himself was half Black. It also makes me think back to the religious note. So, you know, the Catholic Church, a big way to convey the, the eternal truths of the faith is through art and through, you know, the democratization of beauty, telling these stories for most people who cannot read and cannot, you know, understand the faith, you know, through logic and, and essay and book and everything. So it sounds like Douglas is maybe also appealing to that democratization of beauty and his, you know, vision. Oh, yeah. And I think that was, you know, something that was shared by the, the abolitionist movement in general. Uh, you know, that's why Harry at Beecher Stowe would have a bigger impact on the American understanding of slavery than any number of speeches by, you know, some famous Charles Sumner or, or John C. Calhoun or something. Um, Douglas says in one of these lectures, man, by the cultivation of his faculties and by the development of natural and external resources, possesses the marvelous power of enlarging the margin and extending the boundaries of his own existence. And that's that's what art is doing whether it's religious art or secular art, is it's it's a, enlarging the boundaries of our own existence or our own sympathies. And and for a moment, when you're reading a novel, you can be, you know, a, a Chinese miner in, in the 19th century or a space captain in the 23rd century or whatever it might be. And that's that's mm -hmm. what art is doing. And it, it builds our imaginative resources that way. So how rare was it for any American to be photographed so extensively in his era, let alone a black American yeah, at this time? Yeah, it, it was not very common. Most people would not have 
been able to to get any photographs of themselves taken and if you did it would be a special event and you would you would go down to the photography studio and it would it would cost you you know a decent amount of money to have a very a nice photograph of yourself taken a lot of people would paint their photographs or color them in some way in order to try and give them a little more more liveliness and that would be something that would be handed down from generation to generation very different from our our world of convenient uh, cell everybody's carrying around a camera a cell phone with a mm. camera in it and uh, so it would be unusual. And the fact that Douglas spent so much money and time, because it wasn't a brief, it wasn't a quick thing uh, mm -hmm. to get this done, I think says a lot about how important it was for him to project to people. Here is somebody who is, if, if you're white, here is somebody who is a black man who is a serious thinker. And if you're black and you see that picture, here's someone who is like you and has been able to to rise to a live, level of national prominence and respect. I think that was really it was much more important then than it is today. And it's still very important today. I wonder if he was also thinking strategically um, in terms of getting uh photographs instead of paintings or, or illustrations. I recall in the film we used a selection of political cartoons, which very often did not depict Black Americans in accurate or positive light. And so I, I asked, was Douglas interested in getting uh, a painting done of himself for any sketches that weren't photographs? Why, well, why was he so focused on photos? You know, it is you, you are very astute. That In fact, that became kind of a problem for Douglas, kind of a controversy for Douglas when his um, – uh, first version of his memoirs was published. So Douglas's mm -hmm. uh, memoirs, were, he, had, he revised it repeatedly. The first version was called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass and American Slaves, published in 1845. And that's the one that most people are familiar with. It's, it's fairly short, so people often read it in school. Then about 10 years later, he revised it into a much longer version called My Bondage and My Freedom. And then at the end of his life, he published The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. Well, when when the first version of his book came out, it contained an etching based on a photograph of him. And he was really bothered by it. He thought that it made him look effeminate. And he was very sensitive to just what you're saying, that that mm -hmm. caricature and uh, drawings and art that were intended to ridicule projected a, this kind of, you know, dangerously negative uh, mental image of what black people were like. And so he was concerned with that and made sure that in future editions of his book that he approved of the image that appeared in the frontispiece of, of his book. Right, because if you think about the political cartoons, right, I'm sure most, if not all, were illustrated by white men. And so they're kind of, they have, you know, the pen in hand and they're crafting the narrative, they're crafting, you know, what that looks like. And so for him to, you know, take over and have a say and a stake in what um, he looks like as a black American, that must have been a very powerful statement. Yeah. And, you know, even today, you know how a, an embarrassing photograph carries cachet with it. I mean, everybody remembers like uh, when Michael Dukakis ran for president, there was that picture of him w in the tank with the helmet on that really harmed his his uh, presidential campaign because he looked foolish in that picture and it was reproduced everywhere. Well, that's in the 20th century. You go back into the 19th century when this this might be the only picture a person ever sees of you, you know, that right. then it matters whether that's a good picture of you or not. Absolutely. Yeah. And if, when you think about it, if you, you know, once you're gone, what is the legacy you have? Of course, if he's uh, giving lectures, right? Um, I don't know how many of them, if any, were recorded. If it's just words on paper, you don't have a voice to go with it. Um, you don't have recordings. So what do you have other than words on paper is there's a photograph that goes with it. Yes, that's right. And I think, I mean, even to this day, we, you look at these pictures that, like I said, he has this this stern, serious countenance. Well, that that projects an idea of what kind of person he was, as opposed to a picture that, you know, if you if there's a person out there who every picture of him is is he's smiling, you know, that it's not necessarily a negative thing. It doesn't mean that that person is silly. It just mm -hmm. it gives you a different image of who that person is. So many of us have seen the an, an image of Frederick Douglass about town. I saw one on uh, the shirt of a person. I saw one on a bus stop poster in an ad. Um, what what do you think, or do you know what the most popular or well known photograph is of Douglass? You know, I don't know whether there's one photograph that is more more popular than another because there are a lot that look very similar. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think we've all seen like there's I think there's one by. 
a guy named Warren, if I remember right, from the 1870s or 1880s, which is a very famous, like one of the typical ones that you see just about everywhere. But he would he would sometimes have several photos at the same photo shoot, you know, and and mm -hmm. and they would these would be sold in, in bookstores and things. You could go in and buy a photograph of, of this person. And um, so I don't know if there's a particular one, but there's certainly a certain image that he went for, especially late in his life that you you know, he's got the, his hair styled in this way and is this mm -hmm. very serious look, you know, people call it lionine or, or you know, he looks like a lion with a mane and. And uh, incidentally, if you look closely at his photographs, he has a scar on the top of, of the bridge of his nose that mm -hmm. was um, inflicted on him when he was a little boy. And um, he somebody threw a rock at him. He, he got in a fight and somebody threw a rock and it hit him in the forehead. And he describes a story about going in crying and his his white mistress brought him into the living room, which was, of course, very unusual and bandaged him up. And uh, he carried that scar for the rest of his life. And you can still see it in all these pictures. What Was there one photographer in particular who photographed him most? And did he have any issues getting photographed as a Black American? I could imagine that, you know, I don't know that every photographer would want to photograph, you know, a, a Black American at the time. Um, what was what, Did he have like a go-to photographer? I don't think so. I think he traveled so much that he would just stop at whatever photography studio was, was in town. And I, although I don't know of any particular stories of photographer is refusing to take his picture remember also that by the time he really got into having his picture taken he was a world famous figure douglas was when after his memoirs came in it came out in 1845 when he was still a, a, a young man and then he went on this uh speaking tour of of uh, britain in the immediate aftermath of that for that took an entire year he became a world famous figure mm -hmm. he was a, he was a true celebrity and in fact there's this amusing story that he writes in his memoirs about at the sec at abraham lincoln's second inaugural that doug that after lincoln gave his speech and everybody's standing around the new, the president came and and went up to douglas and said what did you think of my speech and douglas says uh it was a, a fine effort mr president well of course the lincoln's second inaugural is one of the great speeches in american mm -hmm. history right but it's the way that Douglas tells this story is that, well, isn't it great that the president actually asked me what I thought of his speech? But the actual reality of it is the reverse. Douglas was such a famous and respected orator, and Lincoln mm. was not. He was president mm -hmm. of the United States, but he was not he was not really a renowned public speaker. He was famous, but not admired for his public mm -hmm. speaking abilities. And so Lincoln really did want to know what Douglas thought of his speech. He was eager to have Douglas's approval of his speech because Douglas was a world famous public speaker. So when Douglas would come in and take his picture in your photography studio, you know, he was a celebrity. So I think he probably encountered probably less problems in that regard than other black Americans would have at the time. Now, there is also this amusing story from late in his life when Douglas uh, and I was, was friends with Ida Wells, and he went to visit her at her office one day and then said, let's go to lunch. And she, he said, what's the best place around here to have lunch? And she said, well, there's this restaurant down, down the street, but it, it doesn't serve black people. And Douglas says, well, we'll see about that. So <laughs> the two of them march right in and sit down. Well, of course, everybody knew who Frederick Douglass was. So the restaurant owner mm. didn't throw him out. Instead, the waiters kept coming to the table constantly. You know, is there anything where we can get you? Is there anything? Can I get you another drink? And all this sort of thing. And mm -hmm. finally, Douglas leaned over to Wells and said, I thought you said they didn't serve black people in here. And you and I can't <laughs> have a conversation because we keep being interrupted. So, <laughs> yeah, he by the time he really became a subject of photography, he was such a famous figure that I, mm -hmm. I doubt he had that many problems with that. Anyone consider hiring him as their speech writer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can you imagine trying to do that? I, I, I'd, I'd be afraid. They can't afford him. <laughs> totally, I'd be afraid. Uh, was Douglas more popular in Europe or America, or would that question depend on what uh, era? Well, I don't think he encountered, he certainly did not encounter the same kind of ra racial discrimination in Europe that he did in the United States. And, you know, even late in his life, he was facing segregation and all these things. There's a story that Booker T. Washington tells about when Douglas was an old man, the two of them were traveling on a train and were ordered to sit in the baggage car. And uh, and Washington said something to, the, to him to the effect of, you know, 
isn't this awful that they do this to you, even though you're such a famous person? And Douglas said, oh, they, they can't do they can't do anything to touch Frederick Douglass. They, they, they're only embarrassing themselves. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, he didn't encounter that kind of problem. But of course, you know, he uh, he struck hardest in the United States and, and, mm. uh, and Europeans are always happy to hear people criticize the United States. So. <laughs> so um what drew you to douglas's lectures on pictures well i was in the midst of working on the book actually when i discovered this uh about douglas's photographs and um i've been interested i'm just interested in philosophy generally and it what really stuck out at me was that that instead of just having his picture taken it just it wasn't just a celebrity kind of thing he was interested in these profound philosophical aspects of it and this from a man who had no formal education at all and who learned what he knew of philosophy from reading and conversing with people who were knowledgeable about philosophy in fact late in life douglas was offered the presidency of a university and he he said i i have to decline because i've never been in a in a college classroom in my life and I, wow. <laughs> so but yet here was a person who could wield the ideas uh that were circulating at the time you know w about human consciousness and things with with perfect comfort and with with an independent mind he's not just parroting what he's read elsewhere he's really questioning and analyzing what people are think about um about these these profound ideas uh, going back to his romantic nature, I'm going to read another line that I really loved from the beginning of one of his lectures. If by means of all of the all pervading electric fluid, Morse has coupled his name with the glory of bringing the ends of the earth together and of converting the world in, into a whispering gallery, dagger, I don't know how to say his name, dagger, like daguerreotype, uh, by the simple but all abounding sunlight has converted the planet into a picture gallery. How did he come up with these beautiful metaphors. I mean, it really does sound like he's this, you know, elite educated, poetic, you know, intellectual. And he just, he, he used to be a slave. It's reading this. It's just amazing what he writes. Yeah, it really is. So Douglas uh, aspired to be a preacher when he was young. And in fact, he was a licensed AME preacher. And he uh, began with the study of the Bible and he, you know, studied the Bible at a time and a place when that was not permitted and uh, taught himself to read and read in secret. And um, so his, the, the great influences on him were first the Bible, and secondly, kind of the classics that were, so, that were considered the, the most important in the 19th century in the United States, and that would be Shakespeare, uh, Milton, and then, the, and then the Romantic writers, people like Hugo and, uh, and Dumas. And this was a writing style that was very rich in its language. This is all pre-Mark Twain. You know, American literature mm. can be divided into before Mark Twain and after Mark Twain. So before <laughs> Mark Twain, literature really is very elaborate. The sentences are often very rich and long and, and are very evocative and expect you to know things, expect you to recognize allusions to the Bible or to Shakespeare or, what, mm. or whatever. And very often people will quote lines of poetry and not attribute it because they assume that you would recognize it. Whereas mm. after Twain, uh, literature becomes much more simplified, much easier to read, relies less on these highfalutin kind of allusions. So Douglas was of the old school in that respect. And you're right, his, his speeches and writings are masterpieces of Victorian era rhetoric there. And every sentence sometimes is honed to this incredible power that makes him one of the great writers in American history and entitles him to a place among the great books. It's not just, you're not just reading the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass for its historical interest. You're reading these things because his writing skills are so superb. Here's a, here's a good passage. The progress of science has not been more logical than that of art. Both have grown with the increasing wants of men. Franklin brought down the lightning. Morse made it a bearer of dispatches. And in answer to the increasing human demands of progressive human nature, Daguerre has taught the god of day to deck the world with pictures far beyond the art of ancient masters. And even the rhythm of that last sentence, you can detect that he's been, you know, reading John Milton. There. <laughs> mm, that's amazing. So what would you say is the enduring legacy of the Douglas photographs or his uh, lectures on photographs? 
I don't think that the lectures on photographs have been sufficiently appreciated. I don't think any biographer has spent time looking at the philosophical argument that he puts forward about what art says about human nature. And I think that's partly because Douglas has, unfortunately, been kind of neglected by philosophical scholars. There's really only three or four mm -hmm. books even out there that attempt to analyze Douglas as a political philosopher, and usually people focus instead on his dramatic and fascinating life story. So part of the answer is there really hasn't yet been a legacy of, of his speeches and philosophical analysis of photography. But the legacy of his image is lasts to this day in that when you think of Frederick Douglass, you still immediately have this image of what he looked like and the kind of personality that stands behind that stern, serious, uncompromising face. And I think that lasts even today. Now, it's not as big as it should be because there still has never been a film about Douglass's life. Mm -hmm. And Douglass, in fact, appears in, in, in cinema. You could count the number of times on one hand. There's a, a, he has a cameo in the movie um, Glory from the 1980s. There, he, he, there's, he has a bit of a part in that recent movie about Harriet Tubman that just came out. He, has, mm -hmm. um, he w appears in one or two episodes of the TV series Underground, where he's played by the musician John Legend. Mm -hmm. And there's a few, a handful of other little appearances of Douglas, but other, nobody's ever made a movie about his life. And it's, and it's a real shame. And may, part of it maybe is because they can't find an actor handsome enough. But <laughs> but it's a shame because his his story is so dramatic and fascinating. And it's a great American story that people of regardless of race can all appreciate and admire. Attention, Hollywood. This is our formal request for a Frederick Douglass biopic. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So would you say Douglass is the most self-made man in American history? He certainly is uh, in the uh, competition for that role. Absolutely. I mean, here's a person who... Uh, follows through on the Benjamin Franklin image of the person who pulls himself up by his own bootstraps, except that even Franklin started out with, you know, infinitely more than Douglas did. I mean, Douglas was born not legally owning his own bones and muscles, mm -hmm. and he ends being a, a friend and confidant of presidents and one of the great writers in America. So he certainly, and, and here's another aspect of this. Douglas to my mind, is the most important philosopher before Ayn Rand on the question of the relationship between self-esteem and political liberty. What I mean by that is if you go, if you look at like Thomas Jefferson or John Locke or James Madison, the 18th century intellectuals who are writing about freedom, they talk a little bit of, you know, they certainly are talking about independence. They, they, they place a great deal of importance on, on, on the independence of the, of the farmer in Jefferson's case or the mechanic in John Adams' case or whatever it might be. But they don't talk about the relationship between personal pride and political freedom. And that's a point that Douglas is foremost in talking about. A great example, he wrote a, uh, an article during the war encouraging black Americans to enlist in the, in the Union Army. And he gives several reasons. He gives like a dozen reasons why you should join the army. Never once does he say you should join the army to serve your country. Not hmm. once. And, that, and of course, that's rational because why should, why should slaves serve their country? Their country had abused them horribly. They, had, they owed mm -hmm. no, nothing to their country. Instead, what Douglas says is you should join the army to build your self-esteem. To, you need to be um, a part of this great movement. You need to prove yourself to yourself and to others. You need to learn how to use guns so that you can defend yourself once this war is over. You know, and he gives all these reasons that are all basically, they all boil down to you need to build a sense of self-respect because that is crucial to freedom. If you, ha if you teach people that they don't deserve freedom, that they shouldn't stand up for themselves, then it's very easy to take their freedom away. But if you build in them the self-consciousness that I am worthy of my own freedom, that is the key to preserving their liberty. And Douglas is the first great philosopher I know of to, uh, who, has, who emphasizes that point as a center of his teaching. That's really profound, especially so coming from a slave. The biggest argument is of self-interest is 
you're trying to create yourself, a self in society. That's so really it really is a self-made man in that sense. And of course, Douglas had gone through this. He writes in his memoir about being about when he was sent to the slave breaker Edward Covey at, at Covey's farm in, in Maryland, and he was beaten and brutalized for months. And he says in his memoirs that it worked, that it, it broke him, it destroyed him. Hmm. And then he says the moment came when, like Lazarus, he, he rose again, in a sense, and discovered this idea that I have the right to stand up for myself. And standing up for yourself, what became the centerpiece of Douglas's theory. He, he loved to quote lines from the poet Byron, uh, he who would be free must himself strike the blow. So this mm -hmm. idea that that personal pride is absolutely essential to maintaining political liberty was a, a centerpiece of Douglas's political philosophy that, as I say, I don't know of any other thinker before him who emphasized that point so much. And it, it's really the only other person I can think of who emphasized that point equally is Ayn Rand, who, by the way, is only born about 10 years after Douglas's death. So you really have yeah. kind of this very short period of time you're talking about. Is there anything else you would like to add about Douglas, photography, or the law? Oh, I could talk about Douglas forever, so I should probably answer, <laughs> say no to that. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for joining us today for another episode of the FedSoc Films podcast. Thank you for having me. Our guest today was Timothy Sandifer, Vice President for Litigation at the Goldwater Institute. You can check out the film Image of an American, Frederick Douglass and the Right to Vote on YouTube, Facebook, or at FedSoc.org. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot O-R-G. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe for more episodes of the FedSoc Films podcast. If you like this episode, please leave us a review. As always, the Federalist Society doesn't take any positions on the issues discussed. That's a wrap. This has been a FedSoc audio production.